So this week we're going to be learning about ethical research. Whenever we read research, or let's say I'm a researcher and I want to do research, I there are things I have to keep in mind. Firstly, I cannot forge data. And this is this is um, people used to do this in the past where when they present their results on the um, journal article, they'll make up numbers. So instead of the actual number, they'll change the number to make their study look good. So they'll forge data and that is a big no, no. Um, right. They cannot uh, plagiarize, obviously, and they cannot mistreat human or even animals. And I'll give you an example of that. This was way back in the 1900s. What they did, what researchers did, was they wanted to see the effect of speech therapy on children. So they had a group of 20 children, and um, they split it in half. So 10 children were given positive speech therapy, where the speech therapists were praising them, were being very encouraging to them when they, you know, made those stuttering noises, for example, or where they couldn't, or when they couldn't pronounce something. And then the other group of 10 they were given negative speech therapy. And so what that means is that anytime they made a stutter or they pronounced a word incorrectly, they would be yelled at, they would be belittled, they would be embarrassed. So what happened was they followed up with these uh, children over time and they noticed that those, student, those uh, children that had negative speech therapy where they were yelled at, stuttered for the rest of their life, pronounced words incorrectly for the rest of their life. And the reason was because of that negative speech therapy. And today, this would never be allowed because that is considered mistreatment of human subjects where we are um, belittling children. And we cannot do that because that can affect them for the rest of their life. And same thing with animal subjects. There were uh, researchers that taught monkeys how to self-administer drugs into their um, into their system and so what they did was they left the monkeys all alone in a cage full of drugs and they made and the monkeys obviously took those drugs and you know some monkeys died some monkeys were so aggravated they pulled off all the fur from their body they were it was just so sad to see what the monkeys had gone through so it's not only humans it's also animals that can't be subjected to cruelty so in an ethical, um, well, actually in, in any experiment, a research experiment, what ethical conduct says is we have to protect everyone's rights. We have to make sure the benefits outweighs the risk. And we'll talk about that in a bit. We have to make sure we get consent and we have to make sure that um, we get consent from the, um, or we get approval from the institutional. So if I wanted to do a study in Georgian College, I can't just go ahead and do it. No, I need to get Georgian College, my institution, to approve it first. So principles of ethical research, we have to um, respect everyone. And by respecting people, we give them the right or the freedom to participate or not. They can decide not to participate and we have to be okay with that. They can even leave the study midway through it and we have to be okay with that. Okay, We have to respect their decision. We need to make sure we do not harm them in any way and everyone should be treated fairly. Because it's human rights. Human rights have the right to uh, privacy. So that means that if they don't want to, um, you know, have their name uh, published in the article that that you published, that's fine. We have to respect that, respect their right to privacy. They have a right to be anonymous. They have a right for confidentiality. So when we gather information from them, maybe we're doing an interview with them and we're getting information from them, we have to make sure that we do not put their name in it because that just um, violates their anon anonymity and confidentiality. Okay, and of course, we have to be fair to every single person and um, protect them from any harm. So the big thing over here is we never want to coerce them. Uh, we never want to force them to participate <clears throat> in a study. And this is actually interesting because when I did my study, my research, I initially I thought, okay, I have students. I can do. I can you know give my students a survey and then use that to and do interviews with my students and gather the information and publish my study. But I was not allowed to do that. And the reason was because students may feel forced to do this because let's say they say they don't want to do it. If they don't do it, then maybe um, I could give them a bad mark because they didn't participate. 
right? If I was a, if I was an unfair teacher, I could do that. And so that's what this basically means that um, we never want to force someone to do it, and we never want to make them feel as if they're forced to do it. Because if they feel as if they're forced to do it, um, you know, they'll have that thing in the back of their mind saying that if I don't do it, my teacher is going to give me a bad grade, right? So that's why ethical committee will say you'll never do any studies to your students because that could go. Um, that could, they could feel forced to do it. So um, what I had to do was I had to reach out to students that I was not teaching or reach out to graduating students, but not students that I currently teach. Um, and, and the consent should be voluntary. They shouldn't be forced to participate in the study. Also, when you tell them about the study, you should be very truthful. You tell them the whole thing. Um, you don't lie to them. You don't um, you know, encourage them to participate by lying. So participation should be voluntary. And as I said earlier, they should leave the study at any time. So even if you have great information, great data from them, and all of a sudden they say, you know what, I don't want you to put my, any of my information into the study, um, and I want to leave the study, I don't want to participate, we have to be okay with that, okay? They're allowed to leave the study at any time, even if it's at the very end of the study. And people who can't um, consent, so children, right, uh, we need to make sure that their parents consent for them if they need to participate in the study. So if we want to look at like, you know, uh, cavities in children and we want them to participate in a study, the children obviously can't consent, but we need their legal guardian to consent for them. So again, um, principle of beneficence. So that means you're not going to harm them in any way. And at the end, and I'll, there's a, a flow chart that I'll show you later on. We, we we look at the risk and benefit. So if we do, if there's more risk, if there's more harm to people, then we're going to not. The ethical committee actually is going to say no. You can't go ahead with the study. But if there's more benefits, then the ethical committee will say, yeah, okay, sure, that's fine. You can go ahead with the study. So before any study is actually allowed to be done, it has to go through the ethical committee. And they check to make sure that the participant is never injured physically, you know, emotionally, psychologically, economically, financially, socially, right? So you never want to harm them at all. And so remember that example of that negative speech therapy? Well, that is an example of psychological, emotional, and even social, um, you know, harm done towards them because for, for the rest of their life, they will remember that and be affected psychologically, emotionally, and socially. Okay, so there are some medications that can cause permanent damage. So you wanna make sure that um, if we're doing a study where we're giving our uh, subjects some drugs, they need to be aware of all the risk of permanent damage that could happen in their body. Um, everything should be, or everyone rather, should be fairly treated. Should be treated fairly, um, even if they choose not to participate. You know, we're not going to judge them. We're all going to treat them fairly, and we're also going to give them the right to privacy. So no names will be provided in the interviews. So when you publish it, you won't publish their names. Fair treatment. So as we said, everyone will be treated equally. Everyone has a right to privacy. Nothing. Um, should be withheld from them. So you, you have to give them all the information from your study. You don't want to withheld, you know, withhold or not tell them some stuff that may want them not to participate in the study. No, you have to tell them the whole thing, the whole story. As we know, everyone should be, um, or all the information should be confidential, should be anonymous, because when we get the informed consent, so when we tell them, you know, when we get their consent to participate in the study, there's a list of things that we have to tell them, and these are all the lists, and I'm actually going to give you an example of um, what it looks like, what informed consent looks like. So here, this was an example of, um, this is actually what I did when I had to do a survey um, for my master's degree, and I, um, I did a survey on peer mentoring, and before they take that survey, there's a whole lengthy type of um, thing I had to write out for the students to read, before they can go ahead with the survey. And all this is saying is that, um, here, let's go from the beginning. It talks about, you know, it gives them an introduction. It talks about why I'm doing it, you know, what they will do and I have to be very detailed because you have to give them the full information. I'm not allowed to leave anything out. I tell them how long it'll take. I can, I have to say that they're allowed to withdraw at any time. 
um, I have to state all the benefits, all the risks. I have to say that it's all going to be confidential. It's all going to be anonymous. Right? There's so many things you have to say. Um, you know, how I will report the results. Who am I going to share the results with? It has to be so detailed. They need to know the whole picture um, before they give us consent. And then once we get the consent, they'll click on accept, and then they can do the survey. Right? So you can see that with informed consent, there's so much that goes into it. There's so much information that you have to tell them before they can go ahead and start the survey or before you can go ahead and start the interview. So remember, if there are people um, who maybe are special needs, um, children, we need legal guardians to sign for them. And the key thing here is that when I do these um, information, like when I write these all out, it has to be understandable. I can't use complicated words because that you know, uh, defeats the purpose. You, you want the language um, understood by everyone. Okay, so it should be in easy terms. So consent could be written, could be oral, sometimes implied. It's usually what they say is that when you do a survey, you automatically get consent because just by them doing the survey, it means they've got uh, consent. So completion of questionnaire kind of indicates implied consent. Okay, so what does the ethic boards do? What do they do? What's their role? Well, their role is to protect the participants. Um, they'll protect all the people. They'll make sure that the consent is voluntary so no one's being forced to participate. And they want to make sure that when you do the study, there's more benefits than risk. So what they do is they do the, um, uh, the follow-up flowchart where they look at the um, study and they're like, you know, is there more benefits or is there more risk? And if they see that there's more benefits, then they'll approve. But if they see that there's more risk and people are getting harmed in the study, then they'll say, no, you cannot go ahead. So they'll reject the study and say, you can't go ahead with the study. So to sum up, whenever we're reading a research article, we should look at, we should critique the ethics of the study. We should look at the ethic component and, you know, see, was it approved by the IRB? The IRB stands for the Institutional Review Board or the Ethics Committee. So was it approved by the Ethics Committee? And usually they'll state that in their paper. Did the participants, uh, you know, were they given, did they all give consent? If they were children or special needs, how did they give consent? Right. So was their um, rights protected? What was their private? Was it were their names published or was it anonymous? Was it confidential? Because that's all really important. That's what ethics look at. We want everyone to remain confidential. And then lastly, in your opinion, when you read the study, do you think there was more benefit to doing that study than risk? So was the benefit risk ratio acceptable? Okay. So these are important things to keep in mind that if you in the future ever want to do a study, Remember that it always has to go through the ethical committee first because they ensure that it's going to be safe. No one's going to be harmed in the process before you can go ahead and actually conduct the study.